and we are having let's say two session uh, the first session it will be about uveitis and mainly about infectious uh, uveitis uh, and we are having four uh, uh, eminent speakers they are going to give a small presentation then we will have around table discussions about that we are going to start mainly about uh, with this uh, the first speaker uh, in this session, it will be Dr. Armando Oliver, he is an Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Piero to Rico School of Medicine. He has been managing his uh, eyes and most challenging device patient and education resident for the past 15 years after completing his UVI scholarship under the guidance of Dr. Douglas. Uh, the Oliver is participate as an investigator at the multicenter uveitis steroid treatment trial and the study of ocular complications. And he is having a lot of educations and uh, participating as a speaker in many places. So Dr. Arna uh, Armando, if you can start, please. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lambri. I'm so honored for the invitation. Let me share my screen. Uh, Today we're going to be discussing uh, this very interesting case, which we titled Acer or not Acer, an interesting case of other retinopathy. These are my financial disclosures, which are not pertinent to this case. This is the case of a 56-year-old old Hispanic, a black Hispanic woman, who suffered uh, acute vision loss of her left eye of one week duration. This was associated with a localized photopsia in the same eye. She had a negative review of systems. Her past history was that of a mild myopia. She had a negative PPD test, which was done for work a year prior, a history of also of arterial hypertension, some osteoarthritis. Her mother had cancer, however, there was no family history of autoimmune disease. Her social history was uh, pretty much negative. However, she disclosed that she had a, a new heterosexual partner with whom she had had unprotected sex two months prior to presentation. The right eye was uh, pretty much normal with the 2020 visual acuity. In the left eye, her visual acuity was finger counting at two feet. She had a one plus afferent pupillary defect and one plus feature cells. Uh, in the fundus exam, uh, it looked pretty normal. The right eye, she had a, a mild posterior staphyloma and some drusen. However, in the left eye, when we have a closer look, we know that there is this demarcation line um, here, um, superior to the disc. We order further workup. And in the fundus autofluorescence of the left eye, we see that there's this area of increased hyper, of increased autofluorescence corresponding to the area of retinal involvement that goes all the way to where the demarcation line is. In the fluorescein angiogram, there's hyperfluorescence of that demarcation line, as well as some periphlebitis in the area of retinal involvement. The ICG test showed a geographic zone of hypocyanescence uh, that corresponded as well with the area of involved retina. We got an OCT, which we can see in the right eye is normal. In the left eye, it showed some vitreous cells. There was also loss of the ellipsoid zone as well as some drusenoid deposits. So uh, also we, we got a visual field test. It showed a central scotoma with temporal extension in the, in the left eye as well. So what are we thinking? This is a summary of, of what we have in, in this patient. And well, uh, it seems the patient ha has ACER. That's what we're thinking. So well, this looks like ACER. Uh, wouldn't everybody agree? Well, uh, ACER was first described in 1992 by Dr. Dungas, and it is characterized by things that our patients shared, like the localized photopsia, acute scotoma, uh, a sonal loss of outer retinal function, scotomas in the temporal field, patients may have an APD, they tend to be young females, and it's, it's, it has been uh, documented to occur in Hispanics. It's also typically unilateral, as our patient had. Also, ACER tends to have this trisonal uh, distribution where we have a zone of normal retina, a, a zone that's actively involved in a zone of atrophy. And if we look closely, we can sort of demarcate those three cells in our patient as well. 
So we're thinking, well, patient, it seems like she has ACER. However, as UBI specialists, we have to rule out uh, secondary causes. So we ordered uh, a workup. We must rule out syphilis, tuberculosis, and other things such as sarcoidosis. So we order a workup, and lo and behold, the patient is positive for syphilis. This is a game changer. We admitted the patient to the ward. We treated her with IV penicillin. We started oral prednisone, consulted infectious diseases, and we got a spinal tap, which was negative. And on, on the physical exam, she did have this uh, macular papular rash, which was characteristic of, of secondary syphilis. However, when we look at the different um, known or, or purple infestations of posterior syphilitic gibiitis, we wonder where does our patient fit? And one might think, well, is this posterior placoid called retinitis? The problem is that for, for acute syphilitic posterior placoid called retinitis, you need a plaque, a placoid lesion. And, uh, and also, uh, this, although this condition is also associated with ellipsoid zone disruption, it's a little bit different. These patients tend to have a little bit more of anterior chamber of vitreous inflammation. It, it's as all syphilis, it can occur in HIV patients and people with neurosyphilis, but our patient did not have the plaque. When we look closely, this is a typical case of, of, of syphilitic placoid retinitis. We can argue that they tend to have a demarcation line, but that seem, that's almost always hypofluorescent, and her patient had a hyperfluorescent demarcation line, and she did not have a plaque. So what does she have? Well, she had syphilitic outer retinopathy. Thus far, 10 cases have been published in the medical literature. Our case has uh, been submitted. And we perform a systematic review of the literature of syphilitic outer retinopathy. And we found that there had been 16 eyes of, of 11 patients, including ours. Uh, it's characterized by ellipsoid zone disruption, which is, is found on all patients. They also universally have hyperautofluorescence in the cor in corresponding to the affected areas. However, uh, in contrast with placoid, uh, syphilitic placoid retinitis, in SOR, the fundus tends to be unremarkable. In this report, four of the patients were noted to have a normal fundus, no changes, and two had very subtle RPE changes. And instead of having a full uh, infraocular inflammation, most of them, a, a minority of them actually had like some mild vitritis, one plus vitritis. Two patients had a demarcation line, which is a typical feature of ACER, just like our patient did. And what seems to be characteristic and differentiating SOR from ACER is the fact that uh, in in six of the patients that had an IVFA, three of them tend to have exactly. this IV periflevitis. So that's uh, that's one thing that seems to differentiate SOR from, from the non-infectious ACER. Uh, mean age was 48 years. They, they Some of them were had were HIV positive, as can be seen in syphilis. The visual, uh, they all presented with blurred vision. Some of them had photopsias. Uh, the visual presenting visual acuity, 37% were worse than 2200, but 25% was better than 2050. And there was some affection of the visual field in, in most of the patients that had a visual field. We did not find a specific scotoma for the condition. However, the scotoma tended to correspond Respond with the area of retinal involvement. The prognosis for syphilitic outer retinopathy seems to be good. Uh, 10 out of 16 eyes ended up with a 20-20 visual acuity, while everybody had at least 20-40 vision at, at the final visual acuity, which uh, the final uh, visit, which occurred at a median follow-up of four months. Uh, four out of 11 cases had a follow-up of over one year. One patient had a continued uh, ellipsoid zone improvement with almost restoration of the ellipsoid zone by 18 months, and a patient had continued visual field improvement over two years. Now, as far as treatment, as with all ocular syphilis, this patient uh, should be treated as neurosyphilis. Of course, the optimal treatment is IV penicillin, which should be given as three to four million units IV every four hours for 10 to 14 days. However, a recent study from the University of Washington where they randomized 150 patients to either uh, intramuscular penicillin with or, or penicillin G found no statistical difference between the two uh, protocols for neurosyphilis. But I must note that they use a very st uh, strict 
protocol for intramuscular penicillin. They, they use 2.4 units intramuscularly every 24 hours for 10 to 14 days. Plus they added probenicid uh, at a dose of 0.5 grams orally four times daily. Um, so that's a little bit cumbersome, but uh, if, if they followed that protocol, they found no difference. IV ceftriaxone, some reports uh, of, of SOR being treated, there are some reports of SOR being treated with ceftriaxone, however, that can have a failure rate, which may be as high uh, as, as 23%, particularly in, in HIV positive patients. Now, interestingly, <clears throat> Adjuvant steroids were used for some of these cases. Uh, in five out of 11 cases, steroids were used. In three patients, the authors were thinking so much about ACER that they even started the steroids before uh, making the diagnosis of syphilis. Interestingly, one of those patients had a visual acuity improvement from 2160 to 2032 just on steroids before uh, any penicillin treatment. So that brought the question on whether immune mimicry may play a role in this entity. Uh, one other case uh, uh, had developed CME during the course of intravenous penicillin, and, and, and that edema resolved uh, after a five-week course of oral prednisone, so the author wondered if there was something like the heidi hersmeyer reaction occurring in these patients. However, six uh, patients did not receive any steroids, and they did beautifully. They, they ended up with excellent vision as well. So back to our patient, we treated her. This is the picture at three months follow-up. Her vision was back to 2025. The demarcation line disappeared. Uh, she had restoration of the ellipsoid zone. Her on the fundus autofluorescence uh, improved dramatically. We can see on the left, the, the original one, and, and this is on the right, the, the last follow-up. Her fluorescein angiogram pretty much normalized. Yeah, just and on the ICU, we still saw some little remnants of hypocyanescence at the three month follow up visit. However, she did well. So, to conclude, the differential diagnosis of ASOR may include inflammatory and infectious etiologies, in particular syphilis. Physicians should always keep syphilis in the differential of all uveitis entities. The role of steroids in syphilitic uh, outer retinopathy remains undetermined. However, their use uh, did not seem to be harmful. And all patients with ocular syphilis should be tested for HIV as the conditions share multiple risk factors and co-infection is common. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors and thank you so much for, for your attention to this case. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Armando. It's very nice and very excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, there is a lot of questions, I think, but maybe after we hear all our uh, participants in this, then we'll have around a table discussion. Ahmed? Yes, uh, no, I so think that's a great. I just have one quick question to Armando. So Armando, uh, how we diagnose syphilis? What, what are the main, so for the audience, what are the main features that will make us think this is a syphilitic retinitis? Oh, so well, the, 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 yeah. the thing is, it's in the differential of everything. So right. it's, it's, it's like a dogma for, for us, we had especially said we must test everything for syphilis. There, of course, there are some things that are typical, like toxoplasma. We see a, a focal retinitis uh, next to a scar. Then we, we might think that patient has toxoplasmosis. And, there, and, and like viral retinitis, there are some things that are so but typical. Syphilis, is there anything but, like in particular that would make you think this is syphilis? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would love to answer yes, but responsibly I have to answer no because I want right. everybody to think about syphilis all the time. So but maybe if you have a yeah, maybe there, there's, there's, there's a pathognomonic uh, fissure, right. which are these small deposits uh, on top of the retina and in the whitish deposits. They they seem to be pathognomonic in in, in syphilis, but uh, that I wouldn't tell them like uh, unless you see that, don't order a test. You have to order a test for syphilis for pretty much all cases of. Of right. Thanks. So yeah, we have the macular lesion on the salt of pepper uh, maculopathy mm -hmm. as well. And uh, maybe... I think Ahmed, mm -hmm. if you allow me, uh, yeah. if you want to discuss, we can discuss one one by one, or at the end, which one you like better. I was thinking one by one, but if you want to make it at the end, whatever. No, you as want you like. Do. If you want by one, so we can finish because uh, I have also a questions or a comment from dear friends here. Yes, uh, Doctor Brasan uh, um, is uh, sending uh, a comment. Uh, we have to talk, we have to think uh, if there is to look for associated rash and balms and uh, in balms and salts. Uh, this is another thing that we have to. But the main question is uh, what is the history is the main thing that 
tell us we have to think about syphilis or whenever we are seeing uh, any viatis, we have to keep in our mind. So we need to figure out something that we can give this message to everyone here listening to us now. What is uh, your comment, uh, Armando or Ahmed or anyone of Fahad? Uh, yeah, Arsalia. Armando, go ahead. Evening, uh, yes, uh, my comment is to test all uveitis patients for syphilis. It doesn't matter what the history is and how low your suspicion may, may be. Uh, we, we always order the test, at least in our part of the world, we order it for everybody uh, because it's it's a potential curable, curable cause of, of uveitis. And the least one would like to, to, to happen is to end up treating someone as having chronic autoimmune uveitis when they have when they are syphilis positive. And that's something we can pretty much cure with three weeks of, of antibiotics. And if we don't rule that out, then we might end up uh, treating something as, uh, as a wrong condition. And Fahad, yeah, do you do um, anything different? Uh, no, just the same as Amando. So here in the UK, uh, we always test VDRL in all of our uh, uveitic patients just because, unfortunately, mm -hmm. syphilis is on the rise. But having said that, uh, I don't hesitate or shy away from asking about any history of unprotected sex because I think it, at least it gives you a high index of suspicion and then you might uh, engage the sexual health services mm -hmm. to help you treat the patient. But uh, as Armando said, that you know it can masquerade as any type of uveitis. So yes. there's no harm. Um, and at least if you identify it, you can treat this potentially curable uh, and very treatable form of uveitis. You know, the amount of times I've seen patients 660 to 65 and it, it's, it's a miracle. So, you know, we, we owe it to our patients to identify it. Thank you. And we have a comment, Dr. Teresa, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Teresa, go ahead. Well, actually, it's a very interesting case. Yeah, I, I, it, it's important to highlight how syphilis can actually have different phenotyping. Yeah. Thank you. It's a very nice case. Thank you. And just for me, it's there are certain uh, lesions that will make you suspicious macular a placoid lesion, the salt and pepper retinopathy in the macula makes suspicion, uh, suspicious vasculitis with retinitis like pigmentosa sectorial makes suspicious, uveitis with arthritis in a nail makes you suspicious. Uh, and always ask about men having uh, sex with men because that, most patients do have that and also multiple sexual partners. Dr. Armory, any questions from your side? There's one here uh, from Dr. Prashan Rao about testing. Yes. The, yeah. I think it's uh, everything is mentioned already. Just uh, I can write uh, or sorry, read for you a comment uh, from dear friends here. They are participating. You need to, to check uh, for TPHA, FTA, ABS rather than VDRL or RBR. Any comment about that? Yes, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, it's uh, it's a change in paradigm. Uh, maybe 20 years ago, when many of us were studying, uh, we would do a VDRL and RPR as a primary test. However, when as in in syphilitic uveitis, uh, the sensitivity of, of of a VDRL and RPR is 80 percent. So we'll if we do those tests, we're going to have 20 percent of patients that are going to be falsely negative, false negatives. So we want to to screen uh, for syphilis in in syphilitic uveitis. If we can, we should do both tests. But if we only have one choice, we should do a, a, a triponemal specific test, such as an FDABS or a microagglutination uh, triponemal test, as Dr. Prasen Rao has very well pointed out. And yes. that quickly from you in Europe is the other way, right? That's right. In, in Europe, yeah. we, we're still doing uh, VDRL. But having said that, if you have a high index of suspicion, they will then do the more specific uh, TPHA. But you yeah. know. the CDC just came up with this reverse screening a few years back. But yeah. as long as you know about that, that's good. I think, Dr. Amri, we move on to the next one. Are you okay with that? Yes, please. We All right. Go. So our uh, next speaker is Dr. Fah Uh Dr. Amri, if you would like to introduce Fah. Uh, Dr. Fahad is my dear friend. Dr. Fahad is a well-known uh, um, friend of us, and he is many times he participates with us. Uh, he is uh, a consultant ophthalmologist at Royal uh, Halmetrim Hospital. I, I, I get difficulty to mention this town. Every time Fahad, you comment about me, 
That's why I was waiting for Ahmed to continue, but he he make me in the UK. Okay. The, the important thing, I'm in the UK. Al Amri again for uh, always inviting me to share, participate in these meetings, and um, and well done to him and his team for uh, producing high quality webinars. And again, Ahmed Salam for his kind invitation for me to join this panel. So I'm going to just discuss two cases briefly. Uh, the first one is um, I've I've labelled locating the occult infection. And this is a patient who is 63 years old, presents with sudden loss of vision in the right eye with reduced vision. Left eye is asymptomatic, no history of ocular surgery or trauma with a past medical history of a recent aortic valve replacement three months ago for aortic regurgitation. So with that history, my number one diagnosis or suspicion is of an endogenous uh, endophthalmitis. His visual acuity was 360 in that right eye, 69 in the left. And he presents with a marked hypopian, marked vitritis with no fundal view. Uh, this was his, um, uh, this is the phone photograph from the front of the eye. And you can see a hypopian with some cyniki and uh, th um, diffuse hyperemia of the conjunctiva. This was the view of the fundus and it's obviously hazy uh, because of the marked vitritis. So again, our diagnosis was a right endogenous uh, endophthalmitis, secondary to a presumed endocarditis, and we thought the source was a replaced aortic valve. Although we suspected a bacterial etiology, given the rapidity of the history, I kept an open mind and treated this patient um, with intravitreal antibiotics and antifungals, uh, and the antifungal of choice was the amphotericin B. We admitted him under infectious diseases, and obviously at the time of the individual injection, we did a vitreous tap and they covered him with systemic antibiotics. And he had a marked uh, clinical improvement. And we started him on oral and topical steroids, you know, 24 to 48 hours after the individual antibiotics an antifungal agent. However, although his eye was improving, we weren't getting any closer to identifying the underlying cause or getting the underlying bacteria or fungus that was causing this infection. So serial blood cultures were negative. Um, his vitreous tap was negative, which I repeated, which uh, an echocardiogram, echocardiogram, sorry, was normal. So although his media was improving, ocular media was improving, his vision was improving, 624, he was happy. He was still suffering pyrexial swings. So he was diagnosed with a pyrexia of unknown origin with increasing inflammatory markers, despite being treated with broad spectrum antibiotics and broad spectrum antifungal um, antibiotics. So infectious diseases doubted my actual diagnosis. They said, are you sure uh, this is infectious? I said, look, you know, I don't know of anything else that's going to respond that well to individual therapy. But also when I look at his eyes, I can see these, uh, you know, a couple of these fluffy lesions just above the um, the vessels. And so therefore I suspect this is a fungal endophthalmitis. So they took on board what I said, and they actually did a PET scan. So a PET scan is a CT scan, but they use this kind of um, uh, form of glucose that has a radioisotope. So they're able to pick up any increased uptakes of glucose. So it's very good at identifying focuses of infection or focuses of malignancy. And lo and behold, the PET scan showed an aneurysm, a hotspot, sorry, in, an, um, the, in the aortic arch. This is the axial CT scan through the mediastinum showing a saccular aneurysm of the ascending aorta. So essentially this gentleman had an end arteritis, so an infection of the aortic arch wall. They, he underwent surgical excision of his aneurysm and he had a micro, micro, microbiological cure with normalization of the inflammatory markers with again, further improvement in his ocular inflammation. And in the end, they identified aspergillus. So we went from a diagnosis of endogenous endophthalmitis to, uh, to not identifying the cause either in vitreous tap or in blood culture. But because I stuck to my guns and I was very helpful to ID in giving them the confidence that this was an infection, they then requested a PET CT scan, which identified in the end the underlying uh, um, fungus, which was aspergillus. 
So why use um, PET CT scan? It's a radioisotope and a glucose analog in which the one of the hydroxyl groups is is substituted by an eight, uh, by fluoride group. Although it's taken up by cells, it cannot be metabolized, so it's unable to return to the blood circulation. So it accumulates within the cells, and it's more efficient across inflammatory cells. And very very helpful in fact in infection in identifying sources of um, fever of unknown origin. So if you have a true pyrexia of unknown origin, which is defined as a temperature of more than 38 degrees that lasts for three weeks and remains undiagnosed after three days in hospital, um, you can identify the source of infection in at least 62% of cases. So do recommend this uh, investigations to your uh, medical colleagues if you're confident you've got an endogenous endophthalmitis and unfortunately uh, you're unable to identify the source. I think what I could have done differently with this case is not just entirely rely on blood culture. I, I, I could have sent a second uh, tap for 18S and 16S PCR, which may have identified a you know, at least a bacterial or fungal um, DNA. And this is and my, uh, you, yeah, we'll, we'll, so yeah, we'll, we'll discuss this case. Yeah, no problem. Okay, can you get back to your picture, to the picture that you showed earlier? So, so this is re, I mean, patient was inflammation. And uh, if you go to the second picture, to the fundus picture, and just dense fibritis, and you cannot see anything. So how did you reach to the diagnosis that this is endogenous endophthalmitis? Because the patient was unwell? It's purely because he, he didn't have a, have a temperature at the time. Right. It was mainly because I had a high index of suspicion. This is somebody with sudden loss of vision, with no history of any past medical history, say like ankylosing spondylitis or any inflammatory disease that might give you a severe vitritis. But most importantly, he's had recent surgery or recent cannulation. For me, even if this could be inflammatory, I want to exclude um, infection. And therefore, there is no harm with this severe presentation to do a vitreous tap and give intravitreal antibiotics. If it then doesn't improve, fine, you can change your mind and start the patient on a steroid. But if you miss the boat, if you don't act fast and intervene timely, this retina will, uh, will die and you will, you, he will have permanent disability and you've missed the boat. So even if... I was suspecting, say, uh, this is a severe inflammatory vitritis. If I was unsure, no harm in treating it as an endogenous endophthalmitis in the immediate stage. And then it gives you a couple of days to then think about what else this could be. Sure. That's a great point. So uh, can, you, can you leave the fundus picture again, Fab? So maybe can I ask Therese here? So Therese, if you have this patient, but there's no history of uh, any hospital admission or surgery, how would you go with this case? So inflammation and just pan and you can also- Yeah, see so, so for- so, um, can, I, can I direct that to Trace Fad? Yes. Okay, well, Trace, um, how would you- uh, I would always be suspicious of infectious. Right. Uh, the sudden onset, the systemic uh, history uh, would always have to be uh, in line with what I'm seeing in the eye. I cannot exclude the systemic history. I, I would I would seriously think of infectious with the hypopion and all. Yeah, I would think of infectious. So would you uh, still cover for endogenous endophthalmitis if there's no history or you would cover for viral or toxo? Because it could be viral, toxo, it could be syphilis or it could be bacterial. So what I'm just trying to reach to, how would you manage this case? There's nothing really contributing in the history now if we remove the, the admission. How would you start managing this case? If, the, if I'm highly suspicious of infectious, I would uh, go for the vitreous tap and culture, and I would uh, have the workup for the syphilis and the rest of the... Uh, and what would um, you say uh, vitreous tap for uh, bacteria and fungal as well? Bacterial, aerobic, and anaerobic, and fungal. Yes, I will do this. Yeah, and uh, if it was toxo, I would actually have seen as an area of retinitis. It's not likely that we're going to have toxo with this severe vitritis without having... Uh, a well-recognized area of retinitis within the retinas, I, I wouldn't think it's toxo. I would Maybe. go with bacterial uh, fungal more than uh, other infectious uh, causes. Yeah, Even in the absence of a history of admission, just because of cover that, right? The patient, yeah, the patient has been ill and... Uh, no, if the patient, yeah. If the patient was not ill, let's say healthy patient. 
So uh, let's go to Armando for that. Armando, if this patient is healthy and you have this presentation. Well, I, I think I, I agree with Fahad. Uh, if you have a hypopia, you really want to do that tap and inject. And uh, we've done uh, studies here about the etiologies of our endophthalmitis, and we have a lot of fungi. So I would have also covered for fungi. And most likely, I would have admitted the patient. Uh, if had I not had that hypopia, maybe I would have uh, gone uh, thought more about toxo and uh, toxoplasmosis and, and viral. And I would, uh, I've done it many times. I just covered for those two entities prior to giving the patient any service or anything else. But here we have an hypopion. That's a different, that's a game changer. I think you really, uh, I agree with the tap and inject for that. More, more so when we have a, a, a definite vitritis there. Yeah. yeah. That's great discussion, Ri. And, uh, uh, Ahmed, um, I think, you know, it all depends on the context. So that's why mm -hmm. in our UBIADS clinics, we, we yes. take our time to take this very long detailed history. So I've, you know, if, if I had a situation where somebody says, look, you know, I'm, I, um, they sound HLA-B27, they sound like ankylosing mm -hmm. spondylitis, they've had recurrent inflammations in the eye in the past, and this time it's just a big bad iritis, then I might be comfortable to try a steroid. If they have genital or mouth ulcers, erythema and adosum, and I'm thinking Bechet, then maybe I'll start steroid. Mm -hmm. But honestly, if you have no idea and you have no clue and there's nothing in the systemic inquiry that gives you an idea, then that patient may be hiding the truth from you. There may be an IV drug abuser, for example, or there may be something mm -hmm. in their lifestyle. There is no harm in just, you know, go ahead and treat. And I mean, I'm no expert in septicemia, but I would imagine you can still probably get, sept you know, septic arthritis or any kind mm -hmm. of, infection without necessarily having to have surgery. So I think if you're unsure with a hypopenuveitis and a very bad vitritis and the systemic inquiry is giving you zero, the safest thing is to assume the worst, treat as an endogenous. Um, it's interesting in terms, of the, in terms of the tap. In the UK, I can only send it as a culture. If I want to send for PCR, it tends to be the second tap, unless I really suspect it's viral. But I think if money is not an option, I would send for culture, you know, standard gram stain, culture, 16S, 18S PCR, and VZV and HSV. Right. It, I think no so. harm. I think no the harm. point I was trying to come to just for the audience, yeah. the one listening to us, is how to think of infection. If there's no history suggestive of admission, one important thing here not to miss is uh, uh, herpetic retinitis. So sure. that's the first one of to course. cover because everything else can wait. So viral PCR in a situation like this is very important. But if you have, as Vahd is saying, it all goes in the context and re what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a sick patient uh, or intravenous drug use or history of admission, then you're thinking along the line of endogenous endophthalmitis. But if there is nothing in the history and you have a presentation like this, yeah, viral PCR is the first one because it will not wait. The patient will be detached or we have bilateral disease next day. Mm -hmm. Fab, this is Definitely. great discussion. Thank you so much. Can you move on? Uh, Ahmed, we have a few comments and questions. Yes. If, we, if we already are talking about the same. Uh, yes, yes, please go ahead, Dr. Mohammed. I cannot see. Yeah, we are having also from a dear friend, also Dr. Prasan Rao, is the VR surgeon. Was there any association subretinal abscess as aspergillus usually has an affinity to grow in the subretinal space? These are the questions. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, this patient didn't. So once the once it all cleared, he had a completely intact and flat retina. So this was his vitreous inflammation or vitreous infection. Okay. Sorry. There is also from Dr. Ashraf. He is asking also. Uh, uh, he is suggesting I will cover virus and toxo uh, till result come. This is his opinion also. If any comment about that. Virus is the most important. Even toxo can wait, but yes. uh, virus three is the most important. Uh, you mm -hmm. can cover toxo as well with medications. I don't know uh, if any of the, uh, I think that's what was, was said really, but virus is the most important, mm -hmm. but it all goes with the history as Fahd was saying. So it depends on what history. Here the history is very suggestive of, or at least makes you think endogenous endophthalmitis, the admission you know, and the aortic replacement, right? One, th one thing I do is uh, I, I, I give this patient empiric therapy and I start on clindamycin, hyperfluxacin uh, IV and also antiviral. So I'm covering pretty much uh, everything. And also we do a lot of oriconosol. So we don't have any problems on starting them on empiric therapy while we f figure out what's happening. Uh, and then when we give them clindamycin as a systemic therapy for endogenous, we're also covering 
covering for toxoplasma. So we cover, we, we, we usually cover for a whole lot of stuff uh, when, when we treat them empirically while the cultures are out and the PCRs. Yeah, Professor Leifman as well. If the clinical presentation is not clear, so you will you'll try to give antibiotic, also antiviral and antitoxo till you get the results. Is this uh, yes, we, we just go very uh, broad spectrum to anything we can suspect, and then we start, you know, uh, as, as, as the, the evolution of the case evolves, we, we start uh, narrowing down what we're dealing with. But really, the, we really don't want to miss anything, as I met very well. But maybe the message is really like uh, cover for the important ones, and if you can cover exactly. for all, I think that's an idea. Viral, and again, I think Pat said it all, it's all in the context. Of course. So, just remember viral retinitis. Mm -hmm. There was a question about the role of vitrectomy uh, in fungal endophthalmitis. Fah, do you want to comment on this quickly? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think if your vitreous, so so the two things I could have done differently is possibly when I, when I sent the vitreous tap, sent for PCR, because maybe mm -hmm. the, the 18S may have identified that this was a fungus after all. But the other thing is if your vitreous tap is negative and you still suspect um, an endogenous, then I agree doing a vitrectomy is a good idea because you're, you're getting the entire vitreous and the high load mm -hmm. phase, and therefore your sensitivity is going to be greater. We know vitreous tap and vitrectomy, the vitrectomy sensitivity is better. I didn't do it in this case because he responded very well. His vision yeah. improved so much, I mm -hmm. couldn't really justify a second operation. Uh, uh, I did have any other comment. Uh, endogenous bilateral, usually bilateral, but this patient is only unilateral. No, I don't agree with that. I, I've seen a lot of um, endogenous that can be unilateral, yeah. 30% bilateral. So it's more okay. unilateral. So we can move more to unilateral. the next case, yes, yes. Yeah. Ahmed, thank you for that. Uh, mashallah, you know your st stats. I'm quite impressed, actually, Mashallah. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> mashallah. So um, uh, next case is 26-year-old male, uh, five-day uh, red painful left eye. He had previous eye problems when he was treated in India a few years earlier. So he was in the UK as a student and he's now returned back to India. Sorry, I'll just move these, the screen out of the way. So his vision was 6.6 on the right eye, 6.12 in the left eye. Pupils were equal and reactive. Intraocular pressures were normal. He had a hyper, hyperemic conjunctiva. Obviously, two plus of anterior chamber cells, one plus of vitritis with marked uh, periflobitis and cotton wool spots and venous reduplication in both eyes. This was the um, one, of it, one of his color fundus pictures, and you can see this venous root reduplication um, with some sheathing of the vessels. And like I said, a marked periflobitis with the scattered retinal hemorrhages. And this is in, bo in both eyes, okay? But these, mag you know, magnificent venous loops and venous abnormalities. OCT was okay. Although there is some distortion here, probably a reflection of some subtle macular ischemia. He has a fluorescein angiogram, and as you can see, there's a delayed filling of the infratemporal aspect of the macula. And then there's um, vascular leakage, um, um, confirming the periflobitis or, yeah, the yeah, vasculitis affecting the veins that stains in the late phase with disc leakage. And it's widespread. And there's obviously capillary shutdown. This is the left eye. And this is a wide field image showing widespread um, capillary shutdown with this macular ischemia and widespread periflobitis. The right eye is less affected, but there is some shutdown in the periphery. So we suspected uh, Eels disease. So we did a, um, yeah. mainly because of his uh, racial heritage, because he came from uh, India. So that was my number one uh, suspicion. We sent a quantifier on gold, which came back as positive and 90% of bilateral, but I didn't wait for that investigation. He had um, steroid pretty much within the first day of um, meeting me. 
uh, within a week or so, I was uh, adding the PRP. And then as we were, um, you know, within a week or so of starting the prednisolone, he was also started on mycophenolate. Um, once he had that quantiferon result, IT, IUD, sorry, treated him for latent uh, TB. And obviously because he's on steroid, he was covered with proton pump inhibitors and obviously calcium um, supplements. His vision improved to 6'6 with complete quiescence of his ocular information. And my thoughts were, if I ever run into trouble, I would always consider individual time alone or anti but it never, uh, it, thankfully his, his condition never deteriorated where that was necessary. Long-term, he was maintained on low dose of steroid and, and, and a high dose of mycophenolate and visual acuity long-term was good with, you know, by the time he left the UK to return to India, his vision was 6'6 six, six in the right eye, 6'9 in the left. I do apologize to the audience, but I don't have any um, uh, recent photographs to show the regression of his disease, but he did very well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fah. So Fat, can you take us three, how did you diagnose that as a TB? So what's the, your differential diagnosis of vasculitis? And I know that it's because of the test and also the yeah, ethnic so, background. So, so I think, you know, at the end of the day, when you're making any uveitis assessment, um, and sorry to kind of spell the obvious, and I know I've got a very esteemed panel with me, but essentially take a, what's the presenting complaint? What are their medical, what's their medical history? They'll be cues and, the, and tell the patient to tell you everything. What medication have they been? Where have, where have they been recently? Any recent, any recent unprotected sex, any IV drug abuse? So this patient told me, I've just come back from India. Have you been in contact with anybody TB? No, but I didn't because uh, TB is prevalent in India. That was my, I didn't necessarily take that no as an answer. I then examined the eye. This gentleman has essentially a pan uh, uveitis with a very um, good going peripherbitis in both eyes. Is this infectious? Is this non-infectious? So my infectious causes are gonna be mainly TB, although there are, I'm sure there are other things like Bartonella or, uh, sorry, brucellosis, or not Bartonella, brucellosis or Lyme or whatever you can think about, but essentially, um, TB was going to be my number one infection. In terms of non-infectious causes, could this be sarcoidosis? And then obviously you always consider syphilis. But at the end of the day, it looked eels to me. That's why, I, and, also, and also when I looked at his fluorescein, because of the widespread capillary shutdown and the retinal ischemia, that made me more think eels than say necessarily another cause. But having said that, keep an open mind. He gets a, you know, everybody in my clinic, gets a full blood count using these LFTs, chest x-ray, VDRL. I then do an ACE, quantiferon, and then I wait for the results. Because he's got no active infection, um, I also do a urinalysis to make sure there's no um, uh, urine infection. I start him on steroid. I'm not waiting for TB to be confirmed or included. I think his chest x-ray is clear. I see them see him within a couple of days, he improves. That once that quantiferon comes back positive, I refer him to ID. But so essentially, and then the ACE comes back normal, the chest x-ray doesn't show biohyalur lymphadenopathy, but I'm not waiting for tests to come back, and particularly with him, in this case, because that macula was not perfusing at all, I was concerned that he was gonna have permanent branch retinal artery occlusion. So I was very anxious to start the steroid quickly. If he didn't have a retinitis or a retinal vasculitis, and it was say a vitritis or an anterior viitis, I might be more relaxed and probably wait for the investigations before I go in with my treatments. Um, uh, sorry for a long-winded answer, but I can't no, do no, it very short that's for actually, you. No, that's, <laughs> we're that's an amazing case. How to reach the um, differential diagnosis, and that's beautiful. Ahmed, we need uh, just uh, there's a question have, about why yeah. Michael, Dr. Mohammed, go ahead. Yeah, no, we are short on a time, so we need also to be so maybe aware we move on to one. Three, just three. we need one. Uh, there is one just a comment and. Uh, uh, from Dr. Ashraf, he say why uh, mucophenolate or TP? My, uh, yeah. Why mucophenolate uh, yeah. or TP? Steroid yeah, is point. not enough. It's a good point. Well, the thing but is, in the past, past. Uh, okay, I want. Sorry, harder than Muhammad, harder. Very, very quickly. 
Yeah. Eels is not TB in the eye. Okay. It's an, inf it's an inflammation because there's TB elsewhere in the body. Ste I could not get him below 10 milligrams of steroid without the inflammation recurring. I'm not going to keep him on high dose steroids long term. So I had to add in a steroid sparing agent. And in my mind, Mike Fenlate works really well for posterior uveitis. Okay. Uh, there is another comment from Dr. Brassan. Also, he's asking, would you consider AKT uh, or I think ATT with four drugs for two months and then the two drugs for nine months instead of two drugs only? Is there another protocol, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point. And I will bow to Dr. Rao's expertise on this, um, uh, possibly because obviously he's trained in India of Indian heritage, so you'll understand that they, they're the experts in TBVitis. I can't comment. They, it, mm -hmm. This was managed by the ID department, so that was the choice that they made. Okay, Ahmad, you can go. Please. Yeah, yeah, uh, Dr. Trace, uh, please go ahead. So Dr. Trace Kamal is from El Watani Hospital in uh, in Cairo, and she's a uveitis and medical retina consultant. It's uh, a great pleasure uh, to be with us. Dr. Trace, if you can please uh, start. I want to start uh, by thanking uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting and eminent meeting. I have two cases to present. Uh, my first case is that of a 40-year-old female patient who came with a history of systemic lupus for the past 10 years. She was complaining of decrease in vision in both eyes that started one month earlier with bilateral visual field effects that were uh, progressive. She had history of CNS lupus two months earlier and she had thoracic herpes zoster four months earlier. Currently, she was on Celsef 2 grams, steroid 60 milligrams. She was hypertensive, dyslipidemic, that wasn't controlled well, and she had also antiphospholipid uh, positivity. Biocular exam, vision in the right eye and left eye were 0.05. She had normal eye pressure, minimal AC reaction of 0.5 plus bilaterally. And she also had a vitreous haze of 0.5 plus bilaterally. Looking at the fundus of the eyes, these are montage colored, uh, multi colored images of both eyes. And we can see that this patient has patches of retinitis from the mid periphery spreading to the periphery with adjacent areas of intraretinal hemorrhages and severe retinal ischemia. Uh, Pleuristine angiography actually uh, highlighted the severity and extent of the uh, inflammation in the retina of both eyes. And we can see that the patient actually had severe ischemia. Uh, she had previous labs that showed high ESR and showed ENA that was uh, high also. Uh, and uh, thinking of this patient who has an autoimmune disease uh, that has been long-standing, we traditionally speaking in differential of a patient with occlusive vasculitis, additionally, this patient has retinitis. Would we think of the non-infectious, especially that she's a lupus patient or that she's an immunocompromised patient that might have an infectious etiology? which would be a acute retinal necrosis, TMV, or toxoplasma, because we know toxoplasmosis can be confluent retinitis in immunocompromised individuals, and again, syphilis, as we have mentioned earlier in this meeting. Uh, lupus could cause uh, uh, some form of retinopathy, but it could be either small cotton wool spots or peripheral retinal ischemia with insignificant inflammation. So likely this is not definitely the cause uh, of the inflammation we're seeing this patient's eye. However, she had several predisposing factors for CM CMV retinitis, apart from the clinical picture that we saw in the fundus. She was immunocompromised, she had an autoimmune disease, and she had received a cyclophosphamide for the CNS lupus that she had developed two months earlier. And this was actually the predisposing factor for the condition. So to me, this was bilateral CMV uh, retinitis induced by cyclophosphamide. Um, we, uh, we had other uh, labs done and the CD4 T helper was found to be 38, which is extremely low, making her highly uh, predisposed to developing CMV retinitis. I went on having an aqueous plate PCR, which came back positive for uh, CMV. And the treatment plan was starting uh, both intravitreal and uh, oral uh, uh, antivirals. She had gancyclovir bilaterally, intravitreally, and started on oral val gancyclovir along with oral steroids of 40 milligrams daily. Uh, the 
patient received six injections in each eye, and we can see the right eye initially before the treatment, and this was after the patient had received a total of six injections in the right eye. The retinitis had completely resolved, leaving a ischemic retina with sclerotic vessels and variable hyperpigmentation. The fellow eye, likewise, after three injections, after five injections, and after six injections, complete resolution of the uh, retinitis, and this was initially. So a few teaching points to, uh, to our young doctors. Is uh, the AC uh, tap uh, sufficient uh, to be sent for PCR in patients with bioretinitis or do we have to use the vitreous uh, tap? What well, actually uh, studies have revealed that uh, AC and uh, vitreous uh, taps for PCR in bioretinitis are quite comparable and we can just settle for the AC tap. Uh, the role of uh, systemic treatment is important because it would uh, save the fellow eye from developing a disease within six months in 60% of the cases. It would also treat the CMV viremia that the patient has, and we continue treatment typically for three to six months uh, and when the lesion has become completely uh, inactive with an uh, increase in the CD count to 150. And the take-home message for this case was... Um, that infectious etiology should be considered even in bilateral uveitis, even if you know that this patient has an autoimmune disease, it doesn't have to be always uh, related to, the uveitis doesn't always have to be related to the autoimmune disease. These patients are immunocompromised. My second case is a rather usual case. Uh, it's Great, a uh, sorry, can I interrupt patient. you for one second? Uh, just one yes, question please. here. I think some degree would be of uh, importance to discuss. Uh, Fahd, would you have used steroid in a case like this? Uh, I wouldn't have actually. I, I, because she's immunocompromised and it's a CMV retinitis, I have just managed them with um, either oral. Or we'll, we'll have to move. We're after a short answer and we'll go back Sorry. to phase. Sorry. Armando. I, I, I wouldn't have, no. No, no steroids. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, she, okay <laughs> let me ask. What was your. Uh, what was your she was um, on steroids. Actually, and I tapered. Uh, she was on 60 milligrams when she came to me. Oh, so you were tapered down. Okay. Yes, yes. because so because they were worried the CNS lupus should come back. Yeah. So I I I, I actually you wanted to decrease her down. it, and they refused. Yeah. So we had to just maintain on 40. Uh, but actually, yes, I, I was am on very, 60 beforehand. Yeah, right. I'm quite skeptical in viral retinitis to add steroids. It bothers me a lot. Yes. I, I mean, think I in, would... in acute retinal necrosis, when the yeah. disc is affected, fine, but CMV just because immunosuppressed, but obviously you were tapering down her steroids. Uh, okay, great. well, thank you. P please proceed with your second case. Okay, so in the second case is a 26 year old female patient with decreased vision and uh, complaining of decreased vision with floaters in the left eye that started 10 days earlier. And she had an unremarkable review of system. She was a healthy uh, adult female patient. The left side that was affected showed a vision of 0 0.2 with slightly high pressure of 30, uh, AC reaction of 1 plus with vitreous haze of 1 plus, while the uh, examination of the right eye, which was the normal eye, was unremarkable. Uh, she had imaging done a couple of days after she had uh, developed the complaint, and we can see a small area of retinitis uh, in the posterior poles. Forgive me for the images are not so good because she had them elsewhere and I scanned them. But by OCT, we have the typical appearance of the full thickness retinitis, which is very typical of toxoplasmosis. We have the Hort lesion, which is the uh, outer retinal cyst that is also has also been described as toxoplasma with a very small uh, RPE hyperplasia that we can see likely the area where the uh, scar was hiding. Uh, I had another OC, I had another fluorescein done when she came to me, and that was uh, uh, a few days into the uh, uh, ocular condition. And uh, she showed uh, areas of vasculitis, nasally and temporarily, superiorly, which has also been described in toxoplasmosis. Uh, what's uh, interesting, and I want to mention, is that the patient didn't receive any treatment, and we can see that the hork has completely resolved the retinitis, is starting to decrease. And be, this is because, as we know, toxoplasma is a self limiting condition. So I started my regimen, which is typically sepatrine, clindamycin, and oral steroids that I would start two days after antimicrobials and stop before the antimicrobials. And 21 days into treatment, the patient has started to develop the scar, the retinitis has resolved, and a small uh, inner retinal cyst that we typically see in patients with healing toxoplasma retinitis. Uh, and a few days.
point in here is that uh, would we diagnose patients with toxoplasma based on the clinical picture? Do we need to have serum serology or do we uh, always have to mandate ocular fluid uh, uh, tap and send for uh, PCR or Goldman Whitmer? Well, actually, if I have a patient with retinitis with a scar, and the retinitis is localized, meaning the posterior pole, uh, the patient is immunocompetent, and you can see the uh, vitritis, I would settle for the uh, clinical diagnosis and start treatment. Serum serology, as we know, is not always very yielding. Ocular fluid is an interesting uh, part of uh, this lecture usually because uh, ocular uh, fluid uh, PCR is less yielding than goldman Whitmer index uh, in patients with toxoplasmosis, especially if the lesions are small, if the patient is younger in age, or if the reaction isn't very high. And so uh, usually the Goldman Whitmer would give better results than the PCR. Uh, sure, treatments yeah. in patients with toxoplasma usually wouldn't cure the infection. However, it can decrease the duration and severity of the inflammation and thus de uh, decreasing the size of the scar. And of course we have debates about if this would decrease the recurrences in toxoplasmosis. Thank you, Teresa. We regimens. have to stop here if that's okay with you for the sake of time, unless you... I uh, wanted to uh, move anyway. on to the recurrence, if you would allow me. The patient came back in three years developing a recurrence, a recurrent attack, and we can see that the patient had a small uh, extension of her uh, lesion and two small lesions nasally. Uh, OCT showed that this patient had developed retinitis and also developed what's known as a punctate outer uh, retinal toxoplasmosis, which are pick like lesions that are have been described in toxoplasmosis. And eventually with treatment, they would heal completely and leave uh, small uh, areas of atrophy that could be side, uh, site of recurrent inflammation. And we can see the OCT images after the patient received treatment for the second time. And uh, in conclusion, uh, toxoplasmosis could uh, uh, present different in different phenotypes Diagnosis could be clinical uh, if it is uh, classic. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, treatment would depend on the regimen you would use, but uh, usually it would not cure the condition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think we'll have to hand back to Dr. Mohammed for the anti-segment symposium at uh, in seven. Uh, we have uh, Ahmed the four minutes. If you have any questions, so no problem. Uh, okay, I'll have. I actually I'll, I can show a case because quickly. Is, and... It will be only four uh, minutes. Ahmed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, uh, and I'll hand back to you in four minutes. I just, I'll show here a few thoughts, really. And Dr. Mohammed, please feel to stop me after four minutes. Okay, uh, this is a patient with, where I was talking about, where you have uh, panuviitis with arthritis, you cannot see anything. This is the differential diagnosis always to remember infection, inflammation, masquerade. And the fan said it very nicely, really. It all depends on the context, but if you're not sure what's happening, the most important to cover is viral. So you give vorico, uh, um, valcycle very do a vitreous step, and then everything else can wait. And this patient actually ended up being syphilis. So that's one way of doing it. it. There are some spot lesions. So here, for example, this is a unifocal, retinitis in the posterior pole with arthritis next to a scar. That's an easy one. That's the toxoplasma retinitis. What about this one? That's again a unifocal retinitis, but there's no scar. Again, that's an easy one as well. That's still a primary toxo. So sometimes you have like spot diagnosis and that's with artery occlusion. This one is hard to tell. It's in the middle. So is it toxo or is it ARN? Actually, it ended up being ARN. So that's here where you need to Cover for ARN, you can still cover for toxo, mm -hmm. but you need a vitreous or AC tap because this one is really difficult. And that's actually been, ended up being a, a herpetic retinitis. That's a more classic herpetic retinitis. So peripheral, but when it's the mid periphery, it's hard to tell. And always remember retinitis is infection unless it's Bechet or a lymphoma. Nice. This is an Asian patient with chest disease, significant chest disease. And uh, we were actually suspecting TB. And this patient had TB retinitis because of the patient's significant chest disease. He was also Vietnamese <laughs> when I was in the UK. And in that population, TB is high, uh, similar to East Africa, to East African uh, population. Okay, this is a very interesting case. Here it's presenting with a progressing retinitis moving from the left to the right to down picture. 
and we excluded viral twice and it's not viral and you have this multifocal retinitis and this patient is immunosuppressed. So the one thing to remember that actually toxoplasma retinitis can act very much like viral retinitis in elderly and immunosuppressed. And that ended up being a toxoplasma retinitis. So we, yes, we told you toxoplasma retinitis is unifocal, but don't believe everything we say mm -hmm. because in immunosuppressed patient, it can behave as viral retinitis and even an elderly patient. How many minutes, Dr. Mohammed? Uh, Ahmed, if you, if you don't mind, you can have a few questions to answer also. It will be okay. don't mind. Fantastic. And I think I just want to remind you of this differential and any questions uh, to answer. Uh, okay. do you, can you see any questions, Dr. Mohammed, we need to answer? Yeah, there is a comment so that we, we can just mention it, then we can have uh, your comments or dear colleagues here, Dr. Yeah. Armando or Dr. Teresa. Uh, also from Dr. Brassan, toxoplasma is generally associated with high IOP. How often do you see a TB uh, retinitis as TB commonly involves the choroid? Very, very uh, not common. TB retinitis is not common. Usually you get choroidal lesion or you mm -hmm. get an appearance similar to TB delayed hypersensitivity where uh, was shown, uh, or you get uh, really an appearance of um, like an MP or surfusionus, but TB retinitis is not common. Uh, okay. Are there any I other mean, questions? Or There is one question uh, from Dr. Ashraf also. Does oral... Uh, valg uh, ancyclovir effective as like uh, uh, IV, I think, ancyclovir. Yes, yes. This is and maybe maybe it trees won't answer that. Effective, yes. It's yes. effective. Yes, it's the bioavailability is very high, so and even they're using for systemic CMV. Nine hundred milligram BID is the loading dose for two weeks, and then you go to maintenance dose. One, yeah, exactly. Once a day. I think, uh, thank you very much for uh, our colleagues Good here and time. Uh, Ahmad and Armando, Fahad thank and you so much for, the for this very thank interesting you. session thank about the so It needs more times, I know, but uh, maybe next time we will give uh, more than that. But today we are having another sessions and we need to move to. Thanks a lot. Appreciate thank your present you. with us. Take thank care. You. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank uh, you, Doctor. Yeah, you will be Thank with you. us nice if you all want to join also with anterior segment. It's a very good also session. You, know, you can have a very nice uh, share your experience. <laughs> okay, no, not for you. I'm just talking. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we got we got to speak Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, honestly, so, thanks for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Much. I've learned Ahmed, a lot. Thank you. Can you. Just stop yeah. share, Ahmed, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the reasons. Thank you, Dr. Amri. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ahmad, can you stop share, please? If yes, you don't mind. Okay. Uh, thanks for the first sessions, and we now we will move to next uh, sessions. It's uh, the third episode of Cataract series that we are provided since uh, now one month, and we are having still uh, another five episodes. So today uh, we will have a very eminent speakers that are going to participate in these sessions, and our one. Uh, guest speaker and our friend also. We are happy that he is with us today, Dr. Khaled Abdurrahman Khalifa. He is a chairman and anterior segment consultant and of expert eye center Cairo, Egypt. He's a well-known uh, figure in uh, cataract and uh, doing uh, his techniques. And he is having doing, doing uh, also, uh, I mean, many presentation about that. And we are very glad and happy to be with us, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, as we jewel also our big boss, Dr. Yahya Salah, uh, he's a well-known also uh, cataract uh, and refractive surgeon, and he is all the time with us, and he is one of he, the one who I, sorry, arrange the, this uh, sessions by helping with Dr. Yahya. Thank you, Dr. Yahya, for being with us. Dr. Yahya, also a professor of ophthalmology, Cairo University, Egypt. He is a consultant cataract cornea refractive Eye Care Center, Cairo, Egypt. Also, we are having also our friends, Dr. Sharif Jamaluddin, Professor of Ophthalmology, Head of Cornea Department, Cairo University, Egypt, Consultant of uh, uh, Cornea and Refractive Surgery, Dar al Ayoun Eye Hospital in Egypt. Uh, my friends, uh, Dr. Usama Al Jlady, Consultant of Ophthalmology, Morfield Eye Hospital, is a cataract and cornea and refractive surgeons. Uh, also, finally, and my real and close friends, 
my brother's Dr. Safwan Albayati is a consultant ophthalmologist, PECO refractive retina surgeon, founder and medical director of New Vision Eye Center in Dubai. Uh, thanks for all of you. And now we can move to uh, our presentation. The first talks, I think it will be by, uh, let me check. Um, who is Safwan? The first one is going to be? Dr. Sharif Gamal. Dr. Dr. Sharif. Ah, okay, soft, yeah, soft cataract. I think Dr. Sharif, are you with us, Dr. Sharif? Yes, Dr. Muhammad. Can you hear me quite well? Yeah, we can hear you, but we are hearing a lot of uh, sounds beside you. Okay, I'm getting away now. Uh, okay. I will start my uh, talk. So we are going to take today a lunch with okay. Dr. This uh, sorry dinner with Dr. So Dr. Yahya, which one you like to take? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, it's okay. Now clear, Dr. Yashir. Okay, I'm going to talk today about soft cataract. And of course, uh, uh, this talk is uh, dedicated to the FACO beginners. And uh, my message to them is to uh, catch the tips and tricks in order to perform well in the uh, surgeries as they are going along the way. We all know that uh, the grading of cataract is uh, uh, graded into four different grades. Grade one, which is soft. Grade two and grade three lies between uh, in, uh, soft and uh, hard cataracts. And grade four, of course, is uh, the hard cataract. <coughs> so, the first thing that comes to your mind is, the, is soft cataract easy? And most of the beginners believe that soft cataract is, is easy. However, I, I differ with them because he, even though it looks easy, it is not. I myself fear soft cataracts more than hard cataracts, even nowadays. Why? First, there is no definite line between the nucleus and the cortex. They seem to blend with each other and you cannot demarcate the line of safety between the edge of the nucleus and the cortex. Of course, when beginners start to re, uh, start their fake emulsification, they are happy by uh, removing the nucleus as they go along with the FACO and eating parts of the nucleus from the front till the back. And they, they are surprised nearing the end by a layer of cortex, uh, a layer, sorry, of, sub, uh, of, of nucleus that's uh, formed like a shell. This uh, shell nuclear fragment is very difficult to remove and it endangers injury of the posterior capsule as you approach it. And this is one of the uh, really difficult situations for FACO beginners in order to mobilize this nuclear shell and try to emulsify it. So the soft cataract, what to do? There are four uh, golden rules that we have to start while performing uh, the cataract. Number one, hydrodissection step is very important. Number two, if you can prolapse the nucleus, it would be a good thing to start. Uh, you can perform the cataract using a single hand technique and sometimes the chopper may help in performing the cataract. As I mentioned before, hydrodissection is very crucial in order to mobilize the whole nucleus together with the uh, cortical material, if possible. Because mobilizing this uh, nuclear fragments or the nucleus will allow the nucleus to move freely and to come to the FACO instead of the FACO going to the nucleus, which is fixed and not moving. But of course, hydrodissection has rules. You have to watch out for capsular block syndrome. And I'm going to show a little video how you can, you can fall into a capsule block syndrome situation. It is not usual while performing uh, soft cataracts or removing soft cataracts to, 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 to suffer from this complication, 
But if you are not following the rules of hydrodissection, you can have a capsule block syndrome. What is capsule block syndrome? It is a large amount of fluid flowing by the hydrodissection step behind the nucleus, and the nucleus will rise fast uh, up and block the exit of this flow and result in ballooning of the fossil capsule. And in the end, this fossil capsule will rupture. You might not notice uh, while doing the hydrodissection that you have uh, you have had this complication, but it is it can be noticed by experienced surgeons that you get uh, a reverse shutter or a slight closure of the pupil. Uh, and then it widens back again at the, exactly at the moment of the rupture of the fossil capsule. And while you are trying to perform FACO afterwards, if you have a big uh, posterior capsule rupture, then you will end up with dropping of this nucleus. <clears throat> Here I'm trying to do the FACO. I did not notice as I was that I had a hydro a capsular block syndrome. And while I was doing the FACO, you will see now I'm trying to do sculpting, a divide and conquer technique in this case. into the vitreous. There we go. The whole lens dropped into the vitreous. The second thing that you have to take care of, that you have to, to do, is try to prolapse the nucleus. If you do a little bit of excessive forced hydrodissection, the, the nucleus edge will prolapse, and this will make the FACO emulsification procedure a little bit more easy. We have, as we can see, the edge of the nucleus has prolapsed into the anterior chamber, and this can allow me to mobilize the nucleus uh, easier and better and emulsify uh, with safety as I'm removing this soft uh, nucleus from the uh, away from the posterior capsule. In soft cataract, in, in my mind, I think that you can perform uh, the cataract single handed, not uh, by manual, not uh, sorry, using a second instrument. You do not need to perform the cataract. Uh, using a chopper or using a divide and conquer technique, as the nucleus acts like melted butter. You cannot divide the nucleus. It is dangerous to do grooving because you can easily injure the posterior capsule as you try to do divide and conquer technique. Chopping may be useful sometimes. However, it is not uh, essentially needed. You can perform the whole procedure single-handed without the, the need for a second instrument during your FACO technique. <laughs> this is a case of soft cataract, and we are revising here all the previous tips that I've mentioned, the idle dissection procedure, the wave, we have to watch for the wave as it passes and do, avoid doing hydrodissection. We can prolapse as a, a, exactly we saw here. The edge of the nucleus has prolapsed into the anterior chamber. This will allow this nucleus to be mobilized easily. And I do not need a second instrument in order to uh, aid in removing this uh, nucleus. It comes. It is free floating now because of the hydrodissection, and it can be removed bit by bit. It's like a big irrigation aspiration port. The FACO here acts as a big uh, as irrigation aspiration port. Can we use a chopper in FACO emulsification? I believe yes. We can use a, a chopper in FACO emulsification. This is another case of soft cataract, but the chopper here does not divide the nucleus into uh, uh, parts because it's hard. It, it only helps in 
in, in although it is a soft cataract, but it can sometimes be divided and segmented in order to facilitate and avoid the blocking of the tip of the phaco while doing uh, phaco emulsification. So a second instrument may be used sometimes, and I only advise chopping and not divide and conquer. You can use the second instrument sometimes in order to help you in dividing uh, some parts of the nucleus, which in order to facilitate the phaco emulsification. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharif, for this uh, very nice and uh, excellent presentation and showing the complications and also the tips that and tricks that we need to know uh, in handling or dealing with uh, soft uh, cataract soft nucleus. Uh, Dr. Safan or Dr. Osama, if there is any questions or any comments, any Dr. Khalid, Dr. Yahya. So the, we are having an, around three minutes to talk I have, about. I have one uh, comment. I agree traditionally that we used to say that the soft cataracts are not for beginners. But actually, <laughs> I teach uh, my residents and my fellows that actually, if we follow a, the proper technique, it can be a, the type of cataract that we start. What I mean by this is adding to what Dr. Shiv said in soft cataract, you need to do only hydrosection or do hydrodelineation, actually what we call hydration of the whole capsular bag contents. All will be like an amalgam. Once you get this amalgam, it does, if it prolapses or if it does not prolapse, it doesn't matter. Actually, it's better to be inside the capsular bag. You will only need to use the phaco aspiration part of the phaco emulsification, which at that time is easier for a beginner. The other hand will only be used to feed the, this cortical amalgam into the phaco tip. So this is my uh, comment. Just one okay. comment also. If once you, as Dr. Sharif mentioned, if you once you started fragmented, fragmented, and if you had the blade, it's always nice to use viscoelastic to push this blade away and forward to protect the posterior capsule. If that, if that happened to you, uh, you mean to use this elastic behind the... Uh, yeah. the behind the blade. If you, if you form like a blade, it's always nice not to go too much with the fake tip. You just use this elastic to push it forward to avoid to break the posterior uh, This is a nice idea. I agree with you. Although I usually don't need, but for beginners, I, I, I surely 100% agree with you because this helps in keeping the posterior capsule away especially for beginners, they are not aware that the posterior capsule can quickly be aspirated while aspirating the lens, and they can come together. Uh, although in, in the modern machines, this is a little bit difficult to happen, but yes, I agree, Dr. Osama, uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent idea for beginners, of course. Dr. Sharif, one, one comment is that uh, I'm just concerned about that, whether the uh, incarceration of the, of the fluid behind the, uh, uh, the cataract when you're doing hydro, uh, hydro dissection, it's in the soft cataract. And yeah. we feel that the nucleus wasn't so soft because usually this, this complication happens in, uh, in more harder uh, uh, nucleus. It's hard. It rarely can happen with soft cataracts. So, of course, I, I agree, Dr. Safar, with you. You are absolutely when, right. It when happens you, with uh, hard cataracts. Yes, definitely. But yeah. you might be in cult. You have to watch while doing the hydro. Exactly. It's, it's just to make sure that the hydro dissection step is done properly That's using right. the right caliber, the right tip, and the right amount of fluid flow. So uh, my, my, my just yeah. point and comment here is that yeah. Rotating, rotating the nucleus uh, uh, once or twice easily, the fluid will escape from the bag behind the nucleus and you can prevent this complication. So when you have the jet in this obvious, because we are usually happy when we have this jet of fluid behind the nucleus and uh, uh, we will continue, even we will do such um, a very uh, a small movement or in, the, in the nucleus, but that's not true. Because this um, a very obvious jet of fluid means that there is a big collection of fluid behind the nucleus. And we need to rotate the nucleus uh, 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 clockwise and anti-clockwise to let this fluid escape from the back. That's my comment. 
thank you, Dr. Safan. Thank you for all. Dr. Khalid, you have any comments? You are uh, mute, Dr. Khalid. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry. Unmute. You are mute, Dr. Khalid. Can you? Okay, yes. No. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharif, for the uh, nice picnic and presentation. And actually, uh, Dr. Sharif is one of my mentors. My mentors, and I learned a lot from him. Uh, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, regarding take home certification. Thank you, Dr. Sharif, for the nice technique. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Nice to see you today. It's a long time. Okay. Thank you very much for all. Thank you, Dr. Sharif, for the nice presentation. Okay. Now we will now move now to the second presentation by uh, our friends, uh, Dr. Khalid. He will talk about how to deal and his technique in dealing with heart cataract. Dr. Khalid, the mic is you. Yes. Uh, now I'm sharing my presentation. Is it clear now? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is my strategy that I'm doing uh, today uh, regarding heart rock cataract. And first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Muhammad Al-Amri for uh, the kind uh, invitation to share my uh, expertise regarding a heart cataract. Really, I'm uh, doing lots of heart cataract uh, per year, and I would like to share how to save the ocular structures during the uh, phaco emulsification of heart cataract. First of all, I have uh, no financial interest uh, regarding this uh, presentation. Uh, we all know that there is many challenges in heart cataract regarding all of these uh, capsulorexes, the zinules, corneal endothelium, and I would like to stress that uh, preoperative endothelial cell count is mandatory in such cases, nucleus division and the posterior capsule safety during the procedure. This is the, uh, the spots we are carrying during the heart cataract. First is the uh, corneal endothelium, as I mentioned, and the posterior capsule and the optic nerve, of course, and the retinal vasculature, and of course, the zinules, especially the subincisional part of the zinules. Regarding the capsular axis, we all know the soft shell technique, which is injection of a dispersive OVD inside the anterior chamber, then pushing this dispersive OVD into the back of the cornea to protect the endothelium. But really, I'm not using this soft shell technique in heart cataract. I'm only using a viscote uh, OVD as viscote is a bad pseudoplasticity so that it will stay inside the anterior chamber for the whole of the procedure. And if I need to add more during the procedure, I may add. But because it has a, a bad pseudoplasticity so that it will stay inside the anterior chamber and even with some pressure over the wound, it will not move outside. And due to the sheer motion of the, uh, the capsular the axis forceps during the capsular axis, it will not go outside like methyl cellulose, which has a, 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 a bad tendency to stay inside the anterior chamber. And at the same time, the anterior capsule will be convex liable for extension. And the same for the sodium hyaluronate, which has a good pseudoplasticity so that it may go outside the anterior chamber with shearing effect of the capsular excess forceps. And also the anterior capsule with, will be a little bit concave, liable for a small capsular axis so that I prefer the viscose during the capsular axis. Also, this coat has uh, adherence uh, uh, characteristics for the endothelium and the ocular structure so that it will protect all the anterior chamber structures during the phaco emulsification. And here, this is the capsular axis. I usually start my capsular axis at the center of the anterior capsule, guided by the reflex of the microscope. Then I'm doing my capsular axis. Uh, many, in many of the heart cataract, I don't use uh, uh, capsular stain as I, I depend on the difference of luster between the capsular axis and the underneath uh, uh, cataract so that the capsule is shining and the underneath cataract is dim so that I can uh, highlight where is the, my capsule. And then I'm doing uh, a sweeping of the cannula between the anterior capsule and the cataract to have uh, a cleft between both of them to be able to insert my tuber after that without doing a hydrodissection for fear of capsular plug, as you just mentioned during the soft cataract of Dr. Sharif Gamaldin. Uh, Dr. Khaled, can you raise your voice? Because I, I don't know, I, I feel a little bit... Really? Voice. My yeah. voice is not clear? Okay, Safwan, can you mute yourself, please? Unmute? It's unmuted. No, no, you are okay, Dr. Khaled, but I'm okay. okay but I'm okay. okay, now it is okay? Yeah, now it's better, yes. Okay. 
Then in the step of sculpting, the, the main uh, problem during sculpting is to support the nucleus. Supporting the nucleus by, by passing the tuber between the anterior capsule and the nucleus equator to avoid excessive uh, movement of the bag and uh, to avoid any stress over the zinules, as I mentioned before, especially the sub-incisional part of the zinules. Second is the bottle height and the intraoxidal pressure in the new machines with the active fluidics to avoid any uh, uh, pressure over the retinal vasculature or the optic nerve, especially in heart cataract, the surgery may be a long procedure. Third is the vacuum level. I'm using a high vacuum to avoid uh, uh, any uh, uh, stopping of the bump. At this moment, I will have a clouding of the anterior chamber so that I'm increasing the vacuum level during my sculpting. And here, this is uh, how I'm doing sculpting. And uh, as you see, the uh, tuber is placed inside the uh, equator or uh, underneath the anterior capsule into the equator of the nucleus, supporting the nucleus, and then starting the uh, my sculpting. The sculpting now is easy because I'm holding the nucleus so that the ultrasound is extremely efficient during uh, grooving. And bot in mind that my vacuum is high to avoid any clouding of the anterior chain especially with the balance step that uh, it has a very uh, and a huge stroke to be able to do the sculpting. Then I'm um, uh, dividing the nucleus and exploring the posterior capsule to avoid any posterior polar cataract that may be encountered in such cases or any adhesions with the posterior capsule. Then uh, Then the uh, second part, which is the chopping of the nucleus, the uh, main in doing chopping of the nucleus is to multi-slice the nucleus into many parts, as many as possible as I can with a horizontal tuber, and all fluidics uh, during the shop will be fixed, as well as the ultrasound, as we, we are going to see now, and keeping the tuber inside the bag all the time. Here, the uh, this is because uh, with this uh, effective fluidics and ultrasound, I'm going to sweep the foot switch between the uh, last part of step two and the first part of step three, because all my parameters is fixed. As you are seeing here, now I'm showing the nucleus, all my parameters, flow rate, vacuum, torsion, ultrasound, or are fixed. The nucleus is very hard so that I have to uh, impale the tip very well inside the nucleus. If I fail in the start, then I go to another bar. Don't insist to shop this part. Go into another bar and start to shop. First, impale the tip inside the nucleus. Again, then go into step two, of the foot switch, and start to shop with pulling the nucleus toward the center of the anterior chamber and repeating this many times to have multiple pieces of the nucleus, chopping and chopping and chopping as possible as you can. Take your time to chop the nucleus even up to more than 16 board. This was, will facilitate emulsification and will facilitate your goal with hard cataract. Here, don't, don't feel uh, uh, that you are bored with uh, dividing the nucleus. After finishing the first, uh, 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 the first chop, then you will go, uh, I'll go into a second chop, dividing the pieces that I did into more small, into a smaller pieces like uh, what you are seeing here, putting the tuber at the equator and dividing the nucleus, holding the nucleus very well. Sometimes I lower uh, the uh, torsional ultrasound amplitude to be able to hold this part of the nucleus without emulsification and without aspiration, then dividing into more and more pieces of the nucleus. This will facilitate uh, uh, removal of these pieces, as you'll see during the emulsification. My goal during the emulsification of the uh, nucleus is to have uh, my emulsification inside the bag. With bevel down, and second is negative vacuum rise, if you look here to this part, of the uh, display of the machine, you'll see this is the vacuum rise. With adjusting my vacuum rise into a negative adjustment, this will help that during the machine accelerates the vacuum before reaching the full uh, or the pre-adjusted vacuum, the flow rate will drop into 50% of the adjusted flow rate, and now the vacuum will not build up. Second, because uh, the multi-slice technique of shop I have a small particles of the nucleus, which will be aspirated very fast without building up more vacuum. And by this, we will avoid any surge and we can emulsify inside the bag. 
as you are seeing here, now I emulsified my uh, nucleus, and now I have small particles, and see how fast this smaller particles is emulsified without any fluctuation inside the anterior chamber. And here I am tailoring my ultrasound to uh, according to the repulsion of the nucleus, if there is too much repulsion of the nucleus with this adjustment of the parameters so that I lower my torsional ultrasound into a lower level. With this, with this lower level, I may, uh, I may aspirate the nucleus very fast, as you see here. And sometimes if I have uh, a connected particles, I, I, I start first with this connection to emulsify, then the nucleus will be separated into multiple fragments, which will be easy to be aspirated. But in mind how the length of the tip is inside the anterior chamber, mainly inside the bag, as you'll see in the next video. And here, this is a connected part so that I'm addressing this connection first to separate these particles from each other and keeping the bevel down and the aspirating inside the back till the end of the last piece, not going into the anterior chamber to be away from the endothelium of the cornea. And here it is aspirated. There is no occlusion and there is no surge. And I can be very close to the uh, uh, posterior capsule. And here, this is a side view, as you see how I am far from the corneal endothelium. This is uh, one, this, the view to the left is the front view, and to the, the view to the right is the uh, side view. And uh, you uh, almost hardly to see the tab of the FACO because it is uh, exactly inside the bag aspirating. You have to look into the uh, front view to see that I'm aspirating while in the side view, you don't see anything because the tip is, uh, is hidden inside the bag and everything is done inside the bag away from the endothelium of the cornea with the help also of this coat that's still coating the endothelium. Everything is away from the endothelium. And at the same time, I have no surge because of the negative vacuum rise and the small nuclear fragments that will be aspirated very fast. There is no time to build up vacuum and to avoid any surge during the procedure. Finally, I wish that I, uh, I, I give some tricks to help the audience regarding the hard uh, rock cataract. Uh, and thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Khaled. Always I wish you you well, very nice. Yeah. I wish you heard me. <laughs> yeah, no, we hear you very nicely. Thank oh, you yeah. and uh, your presentation as usual, excellent uh, and very useful. Uh, I, I just, I want to, to before I keep the mic for other friends for us, um, there is a tips for uh, uh, tricks that we need to learn from you, uh, for me, for everyone that they, they are listening to us about the hard cataract. Uh, first of all, uh, when you are doing, you mentioned so many uh, tips, uh, but for me, when you are uh, holding uh, the, the nucleus, uh, I mean, what is the best way to, to make or to put the uh, FACO tip so that you can fix it nicely and uh, start shopping? This is very, very important because we need, you know, it's the, this is the first one. The second one, you like to, to do a shop uh, uh, vertical or horizontal, I mean, in the in the in hard and rocky cataract, which one is more easier you think it will be uh, to do that? Please. Uh, really, in my hand, I, I start to answer the uh, last part of the, the second part of the question. In my hands is uh, the horizontal job is much more easier. Uh, but really, it needs uh, a little bit more control because you are, I'm inserting the tuber at the equator of the nucleus underneath the anterior capsule. And this is a dangerous part, especially that you cannot see it. But what I'm doing is to impale the tab inside the nucleus. Then I, I, I pull the nucleus a little bit into the center to give room for the tuber to rotate around the equator of the nucleus. And then I'm chopping and I'm moving both instruments against each other to be able to shop. Sometimes if it is more harder than it's more hard than this, I may press some ultrasound to help during the fracture of the nucleus. I may press some ultrasound against the tuber so that both are moving against each other, which will help uh, to, to shop the nucleus. And the best part to bought the, the tab is to know what's the bevel of your tab. If your tab is 30 degrees so that occlusion is much more faster, just 
go into the nucleus and at this moment you will hold very efficiently but before shock you have to go into step two of the full switch so that i'm adjusting all my, my parameters into flexit just to move between the uh, last part of step two of the full switch and first part of step three just to do like that not to push into the end of step three as because if i'm at the end of step two i'll have all the fluidics to the maximum and when I go into step three, I'll get all my ultrasound to the maximum because all are fixed or panel adjustment. So that I'm sweeping my foot switch between the last part of step two and first part of step three, impaling the nucleus, get, then go into uh, last part of step two and start to shop at this moment. I, uh, I wish it, uh, yes, very clear, very clear, Dr. Khaled. Uh, there is, when you are doing separating, uh, I mean, you are doing a shopping and you are separate the one you are doing, how far? Because sometimes, you know, if you go, because I saw you are doing it's this hard nucleus, it will be very big nucleus. It will be making a pressure on the genules. Uh, so how frequent you, um, I mean, how far you can do a separation to see? I mean, uh, it's very, I don't know. It's very difficult to, to tell, but if there is any way just to not to, to do any harm or pressure on the genules. Uh, uh, first, we have to, to uh, I have to tell that grooving is something different than chopping. During grooving, I'm supporting the nucleus, I'm holding the nucleus so that my sculpting does not affect the sub-incisional genules because I'm holding the nucleus, it will not run and I'm not pushing the nucleus. I'm moving my tip inside the nucleus with ultrasound only. But during chop, um, dividing, splitting the nucleus and then separating. And I have to feel the uh, consistency of the nucleus or the firmness of the nucleus, not to have that much separation, much force, but only my force is guarded. And I have to see what I'm doing. And if it's not separated till the end, I, I put my chopper a little bit down and I may engage the nucleus again to separate up to the last part of the nucleus. But if it is difficult and there is no space to separate the nucleus, at this moment, I leave it. And at the end, I separate this, I, I emulsify this junction at first. Then I'm addressing each shared part uh, alone. And at the same time, I would like to say that I'm chopping the nucleus, the whole of the nucleus first, then I'm trying to emulsify. Because keeping the whole nucleus inside the, the bag is much more easier to shop in such hard cataract, not to eat it by, piece by piece, because the, uh, the, the last part during shop, it will move away from the tip and it will be very difficult to shop at that time. So that finish the shopping first, then try to emulsify after that. Uh, my last question before uh, my dear friends, they have their comments. Um, uh, during, I mean, the, the, the separation of, of, the, uh, of the nucleus, um, how far this, the, uh, I mean, if we have sometimes a, a hard cataract, but a rubbery cataract, you know, you cannot, you feel that you are doing, but they are just going back together. Is there a way to, to overcome of that? Uh, from your really, experience? It, it, was, it was a problem for me uh, when, I, when I was using a vertical tuber. But with the horizontal tuber, this uh, tuber is a long tuber with a bulb at its end. This bulb will facilitate to separate this rubbery uh, nucleus uh, to the maximum. And as I mentioned before, if there is some parts still attached. I re chop the nucleus and keeping that part attached to each other. And after that, I may inject a dispersive OVD, this coat under the, the nucleus to elevate this attached part above a little bit. Then I start to emulsify this attached part. At this moment, all the nucleus will, all the bars will be separated from each other. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khalid. Is there any question from Dr. Safwan, Dr. Osama, Dr. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Sharif? Yes. A very nice presentation and very nice movie as usual. Uh, the issues is that first, a few, a few things. <laughs> You, uh, you, me you mentioned, definitely you answered the first part. That the difficulties of Dr. Ashraf, uh, Dr. Sharif, uh, there's a lot of sound behind, behind it. So uh, the, you said that it's right. When we are passing the, the chopper, that it's a, it's a bold um, uh, end. That's right, it's a bold end. But when we are passing it between the uh, anterior capsule and the nucleus to the equator, it's not an easy for the beginner. 
and it's carry some uh, risk, but but you 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 clean it uh, very uh, uh, you discuss it in a very clear way that you are cho you are pulling the nucleus toward your side in a way that you are leaving a space or creating a space for this chopper to be. Now the second question: you used a torsional power to create the chop. Uh, that's right. Your hand it's very exp uh, expert in that, and I know you. I know that you are using the. Uh, 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 torsional and the IP was uh, was active, so means that there was a longitudinal and torsional. Do you think that for the beginner, uh, uh, the longitudinal for a chop is better than the torsional because it's more stable, fixed in a way that it will create a fixed chop to hold the nucleus in a way that they can do the uh, horizontal or or a vertical. That's one question. Second issue is that. Uh, 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 starting with the longitudinal groove or excavation in the center, uh, uh, I feel in my in my hand, uh, uh, and uh, here we are uh, we are do I'm doing personally a, a many hard nucleus uh, uh, excavation in the center. It gives at first to, it it releases the the nucleus from the hardest part, and it gives you uh, a groove that groove or sorry, an excavation that's deep that you can hold the margin of this excavation and rotate the nucleus and chop the, the periphery. Uh, that's right, I do agree fully with you that both the grooving and excavation in the center, uh, it can be easy for, uh, uh, for the beginner. Uh, me, it, 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 in my opinion, is that it will be more easy for the beginner to hold the nucleus with excavation and using longitudinal uh, uh, power. I don't. I don't know what. What's your opinion? Um, I forgot the first question. By the way, the first question. <laughs> first question. You. You. Yeah, you, you can answer. you get the issue is that can why are you using torsional power? So, so fan, can you just yeah. mention the question directly? I know you explain yeah. it already. Just to remind that him. Or you used a torsional power in in chop and IP. Uh, and this is the, the first. The first power uh, and yeah. IP was active. The yeah. second is the issue is that you are Let you using... answer the first one question, Safan, so he will not forget, please. Can we go first one by one? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Khaled. But for, for chop, Dr. Safan, with horizontal chop, you can chop with torsional FACO alone or with longitudinal ultrasound or with torsional and IP. I prefer uh, torsional with IP because uh, I, I like to uh, to have a small uh, embaling, uh, small imba uh, part or small cavity inside the nucleus, and this uh, 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 the longitudinal ultrasound will help me in the form of IP. Uh, but if I'm using longitudinal ultrasound alone, it will be enough with horizontal. With the, with the, with the horizontal chop, I may use torsional ultrasound alone because I don't need to embale too much inside the nucleus, except if I'm pulling the nucleus toward the center. This is the benefit of longitudinal ultrasound. But okay. torsional may be enough because I'm using two instruments against each other. I'm not using the torch, the, the, the vertical chop to press the nucleus down so that I have to be uh, uh, catching the nucleus uh, hardly to do a vertical chop. Horizontal is different issue. So the second question is uh, the excavation inside the center of the nucleus. Yes, it will remove the biggest part of the, uh, of the, of the rock material of the hard nucleus, but put in mind that supporting the nucleus at equator will give you the ability to use less ultrasound during this excavation. This is number one. Number two, that don't remove the whole part, the whole hard material from the center, otherwise, the occlusion with the nucleus will be uh, difficult at this moment, so that just keep a hard shell uh, uh, before the uh, peripheral part of the nucleus to be able to impale uh, the uh, tip inside. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Khaled. Can we have Dr. Osama? Yes. Rather than the cavity, excuse me, Dr. Mohammed, just wait. Uh, it's a, it's a, we it's need a, time, time, we, need, we are already in the, in the center rather than a, a, gr a, a groove. That's what I mean. It's a, only a tube in the center. It's not removing the whole hard part of the yeah. nucleus. Yes, so this is grooving. I'm widening the grooving a little bit, not to do a whole excavation or a pole uh, yes. uh, exactly. excavation of the nucleus. Yes, Dr. Osama? Which is okay, simple terms, a stop and chop. Is that right? This is a little bit... Uh, yes. 
it's uh, it's like stop and chop because yeah. there is group at first, but stop and chop you are doing uh, three uh, chops per, per half of the nucleus. But yes. here I'm doing multiple, uh, multiple slices of the nucleus. So the modified part. Yes. Uh, Dr. Yahya, you have any comment or questions? On yes, excellent, Khalid, uh, very nice technique, but I, I want to add one important comment for our colleagues that in hard, the harder the cataract, the more exposure of the tip you should do. In order yes. tip, ex the exposure of the tip uh, as related to the silicone sleeve, because this is the part which is going to impale into the nucleus. So this is one part. And in contrary, Dr. Khalid, I prefer always vertical chopping, because this is, I can do it in any size of a pupil. I can see, do everything under vision. Third, I don't believe there is anything called a, a rubbery nucleus. This is a term that we are used to say, but actually the reason for this, when, you, when it opens and closes, because you did not remove enough cortex to be able to separate. So, the idea of Dr. Safwan, I, I, do, I do a technique called two nuclear concept, maybe later on, maybe at one, another session, in my session we can elaborate about it. I do the, the create the central uh, part excavation, as Dr. Safwan was saying. Then you can see when impaling and doing the vertical chopping, you can see the fibers and you can split it to the last fiber. So okay. it will never come back as a pathology in the lens, it will come back only if you don't remove or split enough of the, of the cortical fibers. But otherwise the technique of Dr. Hayes is very well and it's better that one can learn different techniques and to learn vertical and horizontal chopping. Sometimes you combine both in these difficult cases. And I agree with all the points Dr. Hayes said, excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for all. Uh, we can move now to the last uh, presentation by Dr. Yahya. He will talk about the intumescent cataract. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, again, uh, Dr. Mohamed Amari, for his great effort in, uh, in so many different educational platforms. And it's a lot of time, a lot of effort, and it's, it's really and, uh, a great effort that I would like to thank him for involving me in this. And Shasha, I like I'm not sure, but nothing is coming okay, out. You can stop share and re again. Yeah, now it's okay. It was already seen. Yeah, it's okay now. And uh, I thank also Dr. Safwan and Dr. Osama for their time to moderate different sessions and help us in their useful discussions. So thank you for them really for giving the time for this. So I'm going to touch on the intumescent cataract, the tips and tricks that we can talk about. Intumescent cataract types can be, uh, you can see the cataract, the intumescent cataract in white cataract, which is a different type of softer nucleus or a brown cataract uh, where it's harder nucleus or even black cataract. And you can face also intumescent cataract with shallow anterior chamber like in intumescent cataract inducing secondary angle closure glaucoma or hypermetropic patients with narrow pupil or pupillary block. So there are different, all they share in a main challenge that you really, none of us want to see this Argentinian flag sign. This is the main fear, the main difficulty in intumescent cataract. So all of us want to avoid this, why? Because this will change the whole plan of the surgery. They increase the incidence or possibility of complications like opening posterior capsule, losing the nucleus, implanting a lens that we did not plan at the beginning to, to use. So it's the, the key in, 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 uh, in tumescent cataracts to do a proper capsular axis and everything will follow afterwards. And many of the techniques we discussed earlier in Dr. Khalid's presentation we will be helpful in removing the nucleus, but let, let's focus about the challenging capsular axis. Why it is challenging? Because there is no contrast, the capsule is stretched, there is high intracapsular pressure. So there are three things that makes the regular technique of, for us to do capsular axis makes it difficult. So how to avoid the challenge of ruining the, our capsular axis or in other ways, avoiding doing the Argentinian flag sign. 
So <laughs> we can use the capsular staining, decompressing the back to remove the second factor of increased intraarticular pressure, and then to be able to control the, the uh, control the size and the creation of our capsular axis, so as in other ways to convert the abnormal situation into a normal situation, like we are used to do and follow the rules of capsular axis. So if we don't have the, the contrast, we can do capsular staining, and this we can use under air. Many people prefer this. I prefer using under viscoelastic. Whether any type of viscoelastic, some people will use viscocohesive or helium, here with helium GV or helium 5. That will help later on in the management of the capsular axis by balancing the pressure inside the intraventricular. But whatever technique you use, it's a you learn it and use what you feel uh, comfortable with. To create the capsular axis after we overcome the problem of contrast, you to create the capsular axis, we can use capsular axis forceps or micro forceps, as some people prefer this. We can use the needle cystitome. And recently, we can use femtolaser at some recommend doing a femtolaser capsulotomy in such cases. So there are so many different techniques to avoid this Argentinian plaque sign or to get a continuous uh, capsular axis. And it's very important to have a technique that you are comfortable with that you can reproduce in such cases. So these cases that not uh, put a challenge on you. One is the spiral capsular axis where you start small axis and you move into circles until you reach the size if you want. And in this way, it is controlled and it's avoid the sudden extension of the capsular bag. There is another technique described by Deepak and Baharati, which goes with a, a large needle. It's, it's like 25, 23 gauge needle, puncture the capsule, I sprayed some of the cortex, then do a small capsular axis followed by irrigation aspiration of the cortex to de decompress the back and then doing a snip in this, this small capsular axis and enlarge it to pr the preferred size. My technique is, is a little bit different. I prefer to do the capsular staining under viscoelastic. I swap it over the anterior capsule and then with a 27 gauge with uh, uh, insulin uh, needle straight I puncture the anterior capsule and then I do a curved tear. This curved tear is a very important trick because if at any moment there is a gush of fluid that will induce, will tend to extend the capsular axis, it, it will extend in this way in the direction I want. Then I go out, I go with a cannula, a 27 gauge cannula, like the helium cannula, and I go under the capsule, I spray it, the cortex, and then inject viscoelastic and continue my rexis, and I can repeat the step of aspiration as needed under vision. In this way, I control the high intraocular pressure, intraventricular pressure, I control the size and the shape of the capsular rexis, and in a very reproducible technique that does not really take much uh, time and does not take me into and out of the eye a lot of, uh, a lot of the time. This is sweeping under viscoelastic. I'm massaging over the, I don't need very intense uh, stain because it will appear, you see the curve here, the curve, and then injecting visco, always trying to restore the rules to equalize the pressure in front and behind the anterior capsule. Moving, stopping when uh, injecting viscoelastic again, repeating aspiration as needed. You can repeat aspiration as you feel it's still in one area there is high pressure and then you can control completely the size and the shape of the capsular axis in a very controlled and reproducible way. And this is very important. Again, just to repeat in a different way, massaging the stain. Injecting viscoelastic, I just want the stain to, to be on the anterior capsule. 
Once you open it, you will see the contrast. Straight cystotome. You see the tape, the curve. So even if, if it needs to extend, it will extend where I want it. It will never cause Argentinian flag sign. Going with the cannula, aspirating and decompressing. Going out, injecting viscoelastic, now to neutralize the pressure in front and behind the anterior capsule. I always like to work in high magnification because this gave me very good visualization and control of what is happening. Whenever you feel there is a possibility of extension, you just stop replenish the viscoelastic. You can do this under any type of viscoelastic. And then you make it the size that you want, the harder the nucleus, the, the little larger the, the tip, the capsular excess needs to be. One important tip here, after doing the hydrosection, uh, the capsular excess and bypassing the most difficult part, there is no need for hydrosection in such cases. By definition, it is already hydrodissected. And dealing with the nucleus thereafter depends on the density of the cataract, or the white is the easiest. And the, the hard cataract will be like Dr. Khaled was mentioning. And I'll just show this. You see, if you would gush with that curve, it didn't go out. I do all my cases under topical anesthesia. Sometimes you need to, to fix the eye with the cannula in the, in the paracentesis. Whenever you see if, if, the, if it is going to extend, just stop, inject viscoelastic. It's very controlled. You can control the size. And then this is, I use Neuhan chopper. This is for the vertical chopping. This is a very brown cataract. I, mean, I create a crater in the center. So as I can see the depths, and then I crack. Everything is done under vision. You see the exposure of the tip, even it can be longer than this if it's harder. You impale the nucleus. You can see the vacuum is the main player. And I use the ultrasound very minimal. Ultrasound will need, you will need it only to help aspiration and for impaling. And you see that vertical chopping gives you the advantages of seeing exactly what are you doing. And you cannot complete the case comfortably except if you have overcome the challenge of capsular excess. So the main challenge in intumescent cataract is to do a properly sized continuous capsular excess. Then you can use whatever technique you feel comfortable to deal with a white cataract inside or a brown cataract or a black cataract, the technique you feel comfortable, safe for the cornea and safe for the, uh, the posterior capsule. So in conclusion, intumescent cataract is a special situation that needs a special management and capsular access is the main challenge in such cases. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Yahya. Very nice and excellent presentation uh, as usual. Okay, if there is any questions or comments from any here colleagues to Dr. Yahya? Yes, I have one. Uh, Dr. Yes, Hea, Dr. Usually, yes. the problem uh, not uh, during puncturing of the nucleus of the, the capsular axis, but sometimes in the periphery during fashioning the capsular axis, if there is a, 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 
too much uh, hydrated uh, cortex or lens fibers at this area, you may find the anterior capsule is elevated. And this is the site of uh, escaping of the capsular axis. Do you have any trick to, uh, to manage this area? Yes, this is what I showed in the video and, and I said, but it's a very good uh, comment. You, exactly what you say, you can have the pressure released inside from the center at, at the puncture. And that's if there is this situation, I aspirate with the cannula. But as I said, when you go around and you see what you are saying, the pressure is high in the periphery, you just go with the cannula and aspirate again, and then inject viscoelastic and continue. So exactly what you are saying is very important no, I think because if, if you feel safe only just aspirating in the center, then it can extend in the periphery, like you said. So that the cannula can, can reach to the equator. I'm reaching the cannula to the equator and aspirate. But you don't but need to really- visible. Yeah, it should be visible, under visible. I'm yeah. seeing the tip of the cannula yeah, and exactly. through the, that hole, especially at least 180 in front of me, lower, and try to remove. The lens matter is very easy to remove by this cannula, especially if it is, for example, let us say, uh, 25 or 26. I'm using 25 and 26 sometimes. And, An uh, excellent um, uh, procedure, Dr. Yahya. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Khalid. Oh, yes, please. No, never mind, Safwan. And I would like also to add, as Dr. Yahya mentioned uh, in the capsule access, that for beginners, methyl cellulose is the worst OVD to start with. Using, uh, a, a, uh, let's, let us to say, uh, a heavier OVDs is much more better and much more easy for the beginners to start capsule access in just in such uh, intermittent cataract. Yeah, I advise them to soft shell, uh, Khaled, uh, here for the for the beginner because soft shell it gives a more support as as Dr. Yahya said, uh, especially even even in in, in staining. Uh, uh, definitely, Yahya, Dr. Yahya is very expert in doing the staining uh, under the OVD. But um, a soft shell with the, with the disintumescent cataract, it's uh, it gives more support to to deal with. Uh, and uh, a second issue is that some, um, sometimes when you are seeing that. The, the fluid is still keep coming and, uh, and uh, uh, makes the whole uh, uh, anterior chamber um, uh, opaque. So we'll, we will keep sucking the, the fluid and keep visualizing, visualizing the tip of the uh, cannula because sometimes the tip of the cannula will drag or attract the, that part of the, of, the, uh, of the flap that we create and ending it or or it will be the, the source for the extending the anterior capsule. So, Osama, if you have any comment, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Rahat. That's very interesting. Yeah, just the only thing that in the needling, you could use the same needling when you puncture the anterior capsule. You could do use it the same time to aspirate instead of take it out and take it uh, and syringe. Sometimes you can do it by the same needle. Yes, and this is like the technique of uh, DPEC, which I showed. But I, I don't, I use only the needle to make the cut and curve and then uh, do the aspiration. But of the course, things, there, are, there are very good people doing this. Right? The other things, if it uh, breast in the lens, it will allow some of the, the lens matter to, to re reduce the pressure better. Just yeah. tab in the lens a bit. So it yeah. will allow to- But you have to be better. careful that you yeah. have a curve. If you, don't, yeah. if you don't have a curve, it will do an Argentinian flag. And remember that not all intumescent cataracts are the same exactly in the pressure inside them. So some yeah. will immediately extend. Yes. So that's why I advise for this curve when you make the puncture. Yeah, yeah, it's good. But yeah. at the same time when you aspirate, you are touching a bit the lens that's allowed to, to release more at the same time when you aspirate. Doctor, uh, yeah, but also sometimes when you are using the needle itself, just immediately when you just punch, it will maybe lead to also to this uh, Argentina flag. No, it, it, it never happens like this. Yeah, if you make it a slow motion for yourself or if you see the videos of this, there is a point where you puncture and then there is a gap. There, here is the decompression that will lead to the linear extension. But if you at the same time, because everything is still in the same pressure, when you make the puncture, you immediately curve the, the, the tear in the capsular axis. So even if, if there will be a gush when you are taking your hand out, 
then it will extend in the direction you want. It will never go to the equator. So yeah, but how, how, what, is, what is the trick? How, how I mean, uh, let us be more, yani, simplify the things. How do you do this, the curve, immediately with a small, you know? Sometimes yes, it's, you, you, when, because when, when you, you are going to the puncture, immediately you will feel you cannot, yani, it is only, uh, what I can say, few and less than seconds, and you feel the things is going to be changed. Exactly, but the, the, the whole thing is, when you go and puncture, you have to go out. And going out, you just push the flap. You push the flap to make this curve. I think then you, can, you can you can just run the movie. And tip is very important for for all our audience and for if you can just show the, us again, Doctor uh, Yahya. Uh, if uh, if slow motion, it will it'll be more easier to to learn. But that's Mohammed. Also, it's nice to have high inflate the AC well. Yes, so it's, it's very important. It's very important. All, all the, the time, you the inflate. Pressure. Yeah, okay, but there is some... puncture Argentina flat straight away. Okay, there is something else we need just, I don't know, I am trying, uh, I'm doing this with my colleagues, that we are not doing, uh, I mean, uh, a sideboard, just we are using only before, then we do the sideboard after that. Is that okay? For, I mean, is that help also in to maintain the pressure inside the eye while you are... I don't. I don't think it makes a difference before you open. If you didn't open the deer capsule, it doesn't make a difference. I don't know why it doesn't make me to share. Uh, now it makes me share. Here. You see. See, this is going with the needle. You see, the, the curve is made now. You don't make a straight line. If you look here, already this is the curve in this area. Mm. So you didn't go out, so you didn't give time for decompression. Yeah, for, for the pressure inside to push it to the, away, yeah, to the equator. When you, when you make this, even if there is a gush of fluid, it will turn it in the direction. You see uh, here, you see the, te the tear? Yeah, it will turn it, it, it go out. It's from the beginning. Yes. Then, mean, while you are doing the bangsha, at the same time, it's the same you are rotating. You exactly. are not moving. You are okay. engaging and, and, and rotating it, in the, creating the flap to take this curve. Once you do this, even if it extends, if you look here, it will extend in this direction, which is yeah. exactly what I'm going to do later on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there any comment before we conclude our session? It was a very nice and excellent. We already two hours and more. So thank you for all of you. I have one, uh, one comment, yeah. Dr. Muhammad. Yeah, yes, Dr. During the inspiration of the liquefied material, uh, uh, what, I, what I found that the least OBD to be aspirated is the viscose because uh, it, it has a very bad pseudoplasticity so that its aspiration inside the cannula during the aspiration of the liquefied cortex is very difficult so that it will stay inside the anterior chamber and it will maintain the pressure gradients between the nucleus and the anterior chamber. So you advise to be used uh, like a viscose? Yes, yes, but, but uh, exactly what Khaled is saying is correct. But what, on the other hand, I would like to say that for anybody working anywhere who doesn't have a special, there is not a special one. Some will give you advantage, but once you know the tricks, you can use any type of viscose. But, but you can use viscose, you can use helium. It depends on your level, but at the end, all of them you can use if you follow the rules. I think what uh, Dr. Khaled is uh, trying to say is to start with, you know, it will be more better to have something that a highly uh, uh, viscose uh, material that's available in the chamber and is not running out. So it will be make uh, uh, easy to, to do the, the capsular access. Then I, maybe later after you have an experience, you can change accordingly. Exactly. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, any, uh, before we conclude, any last comments or anything from Osama, Safwan, Yahya, Dr. Khalid? Thank you. Thanks for okay. that. Okay.
Thank you very much for all and have a nice, uh, what can we say, it's a morning already. We are in the second day in UAE now. We are yeah. going to have past the 12. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Khalid, Dr. Safwan, Dr. Yeah. Yahya, and Dr. Osama, Dr. Sharif, and also for other speakers in the first part. And we hope to see you, inshallah, with another session in uh, episode four. Thank you very much and good night. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for the audience also. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for participant, for the sponsoring company, for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isama. You are reminding me because I'm almost...